For those of you who don't know me, my name is Julia Senior. I'm the Director of Fundraising at MS Queensland. And it is my great honour to introduce to you today our next guest speaker, Carney Liddell. Carney is Paralympic gold medalist and NDIS Queensland ambassador. Carney kindly joins us today to share her view on the NDIS and how it will positively change the lives of people living with disability in Queensland by making us all ordinary people. Please join me in welcoming Carney. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. And firstly, I'm probably not going to talk too much about the NDIS now because we're kind of short for time. However, if you want to know any specific questions about the NDIS and how it will impact you, then please ask me in the panel. Um, it's my pleasure to be here this morning. I feel like I'm amongst friends because I can do this. Not everyone's going to have a big freak out in the audience that I can actually move my leg. Um, but I guess, as you just heard, I am the NDIS ambassador, but I'm also a, a Paralympian and I've now retired 11 years ago. And I guess when you meet most Paralympians or Olympians or speakers, often you meet us at the end of our Oh, I'm going to say journey. That's terrible. I just dropped the J word already. But you meet us at the end when we've done all those amazing things that people consider extraordinary. However, especially in this room, we all understand that most of us are born with a whole, what I call a hand of cards or a, a deck of cards, a life deck of cards that none of us really had any control over, right? I'm yet to meet anyone as a social worker or as a, or as a human being that could tell me that they were hanging out in their mother's womb and picking out all the great attributes that all of us human beings want, right? We all want to be as fast as Usain Bolt, you know, swim as well as Thorpey, be as smart as Stephen Hawking and, I don't know, have naturally blonde hair. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and I guess it's really easy for most people, especially random strangers, to assume that my most dominant or my most powerful or my weakest card, depending on whether you're an optimist or a pessimist, is the fact that I was born and diagnosed with a muscle-wasting disease. And I'm pretty certain that most of you in the room understand that this actually isn't a card that I think about every single minute of the day. However, other people around me, again, those random strangers, tend to focus on it way more than what I focus on. And when I was born and diagnosed with this condition, my parents were like any other parent, and now that I'm 36, I'm very aware of what parents want and think about when they're going through those nine months of pregnancy. Because whenever you ask a mother or father to be, what do you want to have? What is the normal, universally accepted response? Right. So obviously I was born unhealthy. And if my mother said, all I want to have is a healthy kid, let's just say 154 times, and then she heard that for most of her adult years, and then all of a sudden she has what the medical community deem to be the unhealthy baby, what does that mean? What does that mean for my mother and father? Because all they wanted to have was that healthy child. And I believe and I've done a TED talk about this, I believe that people with disabilities, before we even arrive onto this planet, we have negative language thrown our way. Even when we're in the room, we have negative language thrown our way that all we want to have is that healthy child. And I believe the most disabling thing about having a disability is other people's attitudes. And when I was born with the muscle wasting disease, I was very much celebrated by my parents. And most specialists told my parents to make me as comfortable as possible, as exercise actually makes this condition worse. They were told I wouldn't walk, I wouldn't crawl, and I would not live past my teenage years. Now, as you can see, I do still walk. I only use this $20,000 BMW type contraption for really good parking and, <laughs> and I'm clearly just out of my teenage years. So how did I get here? Now I'm not a parent. Hang on, what am I talking about? I'm a parent. <laughs> Has anybody else got a dog that gets into their chair every you know, five seconds you get out of your chair and the dog's in the chair? 
So I couldn't imagine hearing that diagnosis about my very high maintenance new farm princess, Tiffany. <laughs> but I'm very fortunate, the only reason I'm here today, out of my teenage years and still walking and what I consider very, very healthy <laughs> is because my parents decided not to listen to those people with degrees. They started me what I lovingly call a crazy rehab program. The reason I call it crazy is everybody with a degree tell my parents not to do it. So they started the rehab program with this contraption, which as you can see is a standing frame. So up until this point, I was about three years old in this photo. So up until the age of three, I didn't move at all. So I, didn't, I was born floppy, I didn't roll, I didn't crawl, I didn't reach for a rattle, I didn't sit, I didn't do anything. So when my parents found this standing from the local Rockhampton base hospital. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, that's part of my hand of cards. <laughs> Anybody else here born in the beef capital of Australia? There's one over there, she's trying to duck, I saw her. <laughs> so my mother found this, the local Rockhampton base hospital. Now you'd all understand if your parents trying to strap a two year old or a three year old into anything is difficult. Now that I'm a social worker, it's also illegal. Um, <laughs> but very smart. I've got a two-year-old niece and holy hell, even these power assist wheels can't keep up with her. But trying to keep me in this contraction, my poor darling father took it into the backyard. She didn't tell us what he was doing because he tried everything to keep me in it and nothing really worked. So he took it into the backyard she had for six, seven, eight days, didn't say what he was doing. Then really excitedly, it was excitedly as a a bloke from Rockhampton gets. He came back into the house on the eighth day with this. <laughs> Put this down in your frame on wheels. Do what all men do, right? We can fix this problem with wheels. <laughs> So I put me on this standing frame on wheels. As you can see, I'm looking really, really happy. Uh, <laughs> on this torturous type contraption, my mother actually pushed me around the neighborhood for up to six hours a day every single day. Now I'm very fortunate, after six hours a day of exercise and rehabilitation, I took my first step at the age of three and a half. Now this to my parents was their greatest day. You know, if you ever get to meet my parents, they will not bore you with stories about my Paralympic achievements, but they will bore you to tears with stories about this day the day that I took my first step, because this was the day they realized that exercise simply works. And all of a sudden they become just like everybody else, which is all we want is to be just like everybody else. And my parents were all of a sudden able to tick off some milestones. I know again, as a clinical social worker, your parents are really obsessed with milestones, they come in with a list and if that kid has not reached that milestone, we need therapy. So all of a sudden, they're ticking off the list of milestones. The next natural step for my parents or any parent is to send their child along to school. Now it was the 80s and children like me did not go along to mainstream schools easily and especially in the beef capital of Australia. So now when we talk about the NDIS, I often get a little bit frustrated with, with some people because it was only 20 years ago that people like me could not go along to mainstream schools. So we, we have progressed quite a bit and sometimes we do forget that. But my mum's a very persistent woman. <laughs> That's a really nice word for it. She fought for me to go along to St. Anthony's primary school. She won and I went along to school. Now, like every other kid, I tried to keep up in the playground. Now, when I do walk, I walk with a pretty, it's a pretty obvious limp. It does get better with a couple of vodkas. <laughs> <laughs> you can't drink vodka in year one. So I really found it hard to keep up. And then it came time for the dreaded sporting carnivals. I still have nightmares about sporting carnivals at school, but when I was in grade one, I had no idea that I had a disability, so I put up, put up my hand. Every single time a teacher would ask who wanted to play any sport, I was the first kid to put up my hand to play everything. And when I did 
try and play netball and basketball and softball, I came home with lots and lots of these. Good try ribbons. Now, anybody else win any of these at school? Yep, right. Nobody wants a good try ribbon. So I was no different. I wanted the magical blue ribbon and luckily and miraculously, and I hate that word, but miraculously my parents in the 80s without Google and without these two words going together, disabled sport in the 80s, they found a disabled sporting competition because the Paralympics wasn't a word any of us had heard about in the 80s. The first time it was on television in this country was 1996. I know that, because I was there. So my parents found this disabled sporting competition in Brisbane. I was eight years of age. I lived in Rockhampton. They put me on the big plane, big city, big first real race, 25 meters freestyle. And now, again, as an adult, and being godmother 454 times, I now realise that when you tell an eight-year-old, they can do anything. Mount, climb Mount Everest, swim 25 metres freestyle, they believe you, because you're the adult and adults don't lie when you're eight. So I just thought my mother was being really supportive and cool by wearing her togs in the grandstand. So she was very aware that her child with a muscle disease that can't lift her arms above her head, I still can't, could not do 25 metres freestyle. But this was the shortest event on the program. So she had to enter me into it. We'd, we'd flown from Brisbane, from Rockhampton to Brisbane. So she'd signed her life away, crossed her legs, crossed her fingers, closed her eyes, hoped a lifeguard would jump in if anything should go wrong. She thought I could make about 10 metres. But luckily for me, the lifeguard and my mother, I made the very, very long 25 metres freestyle in four minutes and 56 seconds and came out with one of these. <laughs> <laughs> the magical blue ribbon sat my parents down in a very official type meeting at the age of eight in our sunken lounge room. <laughs> so in the 80s. In our sunken lounge room, not good for wheelchairs. And told my parents, well, mum and dad, as I had my blue ribbon stuck on my chest still, mum and dad, it's obvious. <laughs> I'm good. <laughs> I've swum 25 metres freestyle in four minutes and 56 seconds. I've won the blue ribbon. I figured it out. What I'm going to do with my life. I'm going to be an Olympian. Didn't say Paralympian, never heard about it, like I said. I'm going to be a swimmer and I'm going to be an Olympian. Now, when I told my parents this crazy, ridiculous dream, which is no longer, it's no longer crazy and ridiculous for kids with disabilities to want to be Paralympians. In fact, it's a really good idea because they now get paid <laughs> to be Paralympians. Damn it. <laughs> but back then in the 80s, it was a crazy and ridiculous dream to want to be a Paralympian or an Olympian when you have such a severe muscle-wasting disease. But when I told my parents this idea, what do they do? They just agreed with me. They just nodded their heads. My mum cried behind closed doors, you know, in the shower, in the car, in the closet where we all cry, ladies. Never in front of the child did she cry, but she cried for a long, long time, thinking how is she ever gonna tell her child that she cannot do the most physical thing you can ever do in your life when you've got a physical disability. Now, luckily for me, my mother didn't have to ever tell me that I couldn't do the most physical thing you can ever do in your life because I did actually get faster than four minutes and 56 seconds. And what I didn't realise at that time, which is quite clear now when you look at that photo, because you can see there that Todd Burmester is getting what colour ribbon? Blue. 
So I didn't know at the age of eight that every single disabled kid gets a blue ribbon. <laughs> but it didn't matter. <laughs> because what happened at that time in my life, and I was lucky because it happened at the age of eight, I actually grabbed myself my own label. And once I found my own label, it started to make me realise that all these other labels that people were going to throw at me my whole life, and I'm 36 and I can tell you now, I'm sure I'm in very good company here, that no matter where you go in your life when you have a disability, people love to throw labels at you. They love it. And they desperately need to know, if they don't find out, they may die, why you are in a wheelchair. They need to know why you use a walker, why you're in a chair. They will die if they do not find out. So at the age of eight, this label that I grabbed for myself, being a swimmer, and I slapped it onto my chest and it became like my shield. It became like my armour. Even though I wasn't good for a long time after the age of eight, it took me a while to become a world champion. However, I just kept on entering races, kept on coming last, second last, against able-bodied kids, but I believed, hang on a minute, I remember I won that blue ribbon once, so I must have been good sometime, somewhere. So I just kept on keeping on. But what I discovered at the age of eight is I made a choice. And this is all our strongest card. I don't care what you've got, what disability you've got, because this becomes your strongest card if you can actually make a choice and you actually find something that you're good at, and then you find the head nodder. So there's a few things that have to happen, right? So I made a choice. I found my head nodder in the sunken lounge room at the age of eight. I didn't have to go and search high and wide, which a lot of people with disabilities aren't as lucky as I am. I wish that I could put Terry and Jeff Liddell in their lounge rooms, but I can't. But I actually believe the NDIS has a real shot at this. I have a real belief, and I'm right in the thick of it. I'm with the 20,000 participants all the time. I understand it, I meet with them, I talk with them. I'm very much involved with what's going on. I actually believe the NDIS will allow people to make the choice, find something they're good at, and hopefully the NDIA planner or the local area coordinator will be that head nodder. But once you find a head nodder, then you're off. And here I am doing my first triathlon at a very young age, an A-body triathlon, A-B triathlon. And my dad is very illegally running beside me. I think he was hiding behind that shrub <laughs> because I couldn't make it up hills. I, he I hear you need glutes and hemis to make it up hills. Don't have them. So I didn't know that at the age of 12 when I entered my first triathlon. So my dad was very aware <laughs> that I couldn't make it up hills. So he should have been wearing commando gear. <laughs> So he'd hide behind the trees and he'd push me up the hill and he'd run to the next shrub or tree and hide, push me up the next hill. The reason I show this photo of me doing a triathlon is because people also want to know is if I have a sibling. And I do have a sibling. My, I've got a brother, Brent, Brent the Brat. Brent is six foot four. Brent is, <laughs> I was going to say normal. Brent is not normal. Brent is able-bodied. <laughs> the reason I show this photo is because Brent did this triathlon with me that I came second last in. Brent, we don't have a photo of Brent because Brent quit after the swim leg because he thought he was going to die. <laughs> now, as you can see, Brent was born with all the cards to be the athlete in the family, wasn't he? Brent absolutely hated sport. Brent did not want to be an athlete like my father. My father is a great athlete, he's represented Australia, and here he is at the age of 62. He's done Tour de France, Tour of Italy, Tour of Adelaide. I've always just really simply wanted to be like my father. And after retiring from sport, I went to a few Paralympic Games, as you saw, I won a few medals, and as you're retiring from any sport, especially at that high level, I was 25 years of age and I had no idea what I was going to do with the rest of my life. I'd done a degree, but I still didn't know what I was going to do with the rest of my life. And as I was retiring and worried about the next chapter, I was very fortunate at the age of 25 to be asked to speak at a medical convention. 
There was 5,000 doctors in the crowd, physios, OTs, social workers, speeches. And my mother really persistently wanted to come along to this particular event. Now, you probably figured out now that you probably don't say no to Terry Liddell from the Hamptons. You don't. So, of course, mum and dad came along for the speech. I'm up on the stage and looking around at the 5,000 doctors and as I'm zooming around the room, I sort of see this guy and he was sitting a few rows back in the auditorium. And when I see him, I realise exactly why my mother wanted to come along to this particular event. Because on this day in my crowd was a doctor that had diagnosed me. So he was the doctor that had sent my parents along to a place called Montrose Home. Remember Montrose Home? When I was about three and a half, four. And we think he thought the best thing to do to stop Terry Liddell calling every Tuesday, because she did, <laughs> it was in her diary, she called every Tuesday and asked him questions about my future, rehab, hope, school, whatever. So we think he thought the best thing to do to stop her from calling every Tuesday would be to show her what this disease looks like and then she'd stop calling. So Montrose Home used to be a place where people with muscle diseases went, usually, you know, in their teenage years. So mum and dad went along to Montrose and they saw children and teenagers, I guess, that look a bit like me now. They were in chairs, they were ventilated, they were, you know, unable to roll over in bed by themselves at night. So you can probably imagine all the parents in the room. This was a pretty dark day for my parents. And here he was in my crowd. <laughs> and then when I saw him, I couldn't stop looking at him. So for 45 minutes, it was just me and him. <laughs> just me and him. Which, as you can imagine, if I just looked at you, lady, right now, it would be very uncomfortable. <laughs> so after 45 minutes of me and him playing sexy eyes, I thought I'm going to have to chase this guy down because I want to deliver my best ever speech to him. So I'd thought about it for a long time what I would say to him if I ever got to meet him. What I'd say to the man that made me realise and made my parents realise that the greatest pleasure in life is achieving things people say can't be done. I had a great speech ready for him. So as I'm ready to chase him down, he starts coming over to me. He was pale, <laughs> he was sweating. <laughs> it was the worst 45 minutes of his life. And of course, my darling mother was also running down the steps. <laughs> so I knew I didn't have very long before she was gonna be right there. So as I'm about to deliver my best ever speech, he just throws a folder at me. It's a manila folder, it's got my name on it. It's like, I don't know, that thick. And as I open it up, all these press clippings of me, hundreds and hundreds of media clippings of me fall out onto the floor. And I'm speechless. For the first time in my life, I'm speechless. And I say to him, why on heaven's earth do you have all these press clippings of me? And he said to me that day, your mother has been sending me bloody press clippings <laughs> <laughs> for the past 15 years. Now, I don't know who was more shocked, my father or myself because mum had never told us. And on that day he said, now Terry, whenever I meet a child, he looks a bit like Carney, and there's not too many of us around, but whenever I do meet a child that looks a bit like her, I now say these three words, exercise may, not will, because we know that it doesn't help everyone. Chemo doesn't work for all cancer patients. Exercise may help. Now those three words are more powerful and more important to me than all those shiny medals that I won throughout my career. Why? Because we now diagnose us with a side of hope. And hope is the most magical ingredient you can ever add to another person's life. But the most important lesson I learned that day was not from him, it was from my mum. And I've taken it wherever I've gone. As the NDIS ambassador, I use it a lot. And that is 
My mother sat in her sunken lounge room by herself with a pair of scissors, a pen, an envelope and a stamp. She didn't tell another human being. There was no media there. She had no idea what was going to happen. But she just sat there and cut those press clippings out and put them in an envelope and sent them. For 15 years, she did that. And she taught me that the smallest of acts can create the largest of impacts. Because now that doctor is a head nodder. That doctor is now a hope giver because of Terry Liddell from Rockhampton. So when I get overwhelmed with the NDIS, which let me tell you happens every second day, I get overwhelmed with it, I get back to basics. I get back to basics. The NDIS is not going to work if we get set up to get out of our front doors of our apartments and houses and then the rest of the community doesn't open up their doors. It will not work. Doesn't matter how good my wheelchair is. And it's pretty damn good. If I can't get a job, which let me tell you, I couldn't get a job for many, many years. Even with a profile and even with a master's. I could not get a job because of my disability. As the NDIS ambassador, I'm actually way more concerned about the, the community. I'm way more concerned about businesses opening up their doors to us. Because the NDIS is here. It's good. It's great. We fought. It's here. It's 1st of January. It's only a minute away. That's done. Don't be stressed about having to do your plans and having to have your goals. And yes, you should know what you'd like to do with your life. I'm fairly certain that if I asked an able-bodied person what they want to do in three years, they'd laugh and think that was quite condescending. So I'm not going to tell you guys to think about what you want in three years whenever the NDIS comes your way. But I would really like it if we could all get back together as a community like we were five, ten years ago and we're trying to fight for the NDIS and start getting out to the community together and start talking about disability in a real way. That to employ people with disabilities is not that difficult because I don't lie in bed at night worried about spinal muscular atrophy. I don't. I worry about the same stuff that keeps able-bodied people awake at night. That is work, that is finance, that is family, that is siblings, that is nieces, that is nephews, that is family, that is love, travel. So I believe the NDIS will allow us to do all those things that keep most people awake at night because we just want the same things as everybody else wants. So if we can get back together and come out to the community a bit more positively and start to diminish those stereotypes that have been developed around what we want with our lives because I'm sick of being the exception. I'm told all the time that I'm exceptional because I work at 36. I live independently at 36. That is not exceptional. I get high-fived when I'm at Storybridge Hotel for ordering a Pinot Noir. <laughs> Good on you for being out. You're so brave. <laughs> Never been to a pub yet without being high-fived, ever. Not because I'm a Paralympian. I'd be happy to high-five you back if you want to high-five me for being a Paralympian. Because now that I'm an old has-been washed up athlete, I get, it was pretty damn good. <laughs> I was good. I get that now. But I do not want to be high-fived for being out with a disability. It's 2015. And I believe that if we start getting louder and louder and louder again as a community, as we were when at those rallies, then I will no longer be the exception because I'm bored of it. I'm bored of high-fiving. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Good on you, Carney. Well done. We go so far back, probably to Wednesday last week, wasn't it, when we met? So, thank you. That's awesome. Hey, can I get my panel members up here really quick? I'm going to steal 10 minutes of lunchtime, if that's okay, because it's almost there. But we're going to have a quick panel session. This is where you get to ask any question you like, and we'll do our best to answer those. Yeah, so I um, time, come on so. down, come on down. So this covers everything this morning or anything outside of that, um, including any, any question for Tim. So is anyone... Got a question or would you like me to kick it off? Yeah, radio. here we go. Okay. Oops, sorry. 
Okay, for someone that's been given an um, TPD, total disability, how will they get back me back to work if I wish to? Um, anyone that can answer it. <laughs> um, well, you saw the video of Lisa. Lisa wasn't actually working in a permanent position. Um, so if, if you have an ambition, and I think, you know, we've talked about a lot of that today, then I think, you know, it's about then um, the supports that you would get um, not only through a, 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 an employment service to help you prepare if you need that um, to get into employment and to, to you know, sharpen up your interview skills and all of those things, but there's also the, um, so there's an, their employment services. But and I've employment been deemed unable to work. So oh, how- you're deemed unable, unable to, to work. work. Yeah. Okay. The government. Uh, yeah, I couldn't do what I was trained to anymore. Couldn't no, do what you trained. But do you yep. want no. to work? You want to clearly work? Not really. <laughs> okay, all right. <laughs> so, so it looks the like question? that's the road they're going down. They're going to try and get me back to work. No? Uh, no, no, no. I don't think so. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And uh, if you're wanting to get back to work, there's, you know, like, there's, uh, there's opportunities out there, but you, if you have to want to do that. Yeah. Yeah. They, they, they can't make you go back to work. And I don't think that well, that's... Well, I can't do the role which I was trained to do. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Now, that's, when I say about work, that's just me. I want to work. I like expensive things. <laughs> I need to work. I live in New Farm. My dog's very expensive. Um, but no, NDI is still about what you want. So yeah, that's if you if you want to do some more rehabilitation or do more social stuff, then that's what you go in with. That's your goal. You know, everyone's different. Yep. Nicole, setting your goal is up to you. No one's going to tell you what that is. It's got to be what you want with your life. Another question. Uh, this is for Julia. Uh, you were saying about, um, up on the panel, about um, people in the family, is there a test that can be done? Because just in my family history, I have MS. My sister has MS and lupus. My half-sister has rheumatoid arthritis and fibromyalgia. Half-brother's got lupus. I lost a half-brother to lupus. So whenever my daughters who have both had glandular fever, say to me, oh, my fingers are tingling, my feet are tingling, goes, oh, go get an MRI, go get... No, panic, panic, panic. So is there a test? So, so there, there isn't a test yet, um, and the idea would be that potentially in the future there might be a, a battery of tests. Um, at the moment, when I said the 110 genes, there are lots of genes with small effects, so we're not talking about things like Huntington's disease or if you've got the gene and you do the test for the gene, you're definitely going to get the disease. Um, but we do, and I, I mentioned as well about the, the overlap with type 1 diabetes, there are um, a lot of family members with a range of autoimmune conditions. Um, so if it was my family, I'd just keep a close eye on it, but unfortunately there's no definitive test that I can offer you right now. Thank you. Tim. The, apart from the hot topic of HSCT, uh, medical marijuana is the next question I keep getting asked, or Sagavex. I believe it's on the PBS, but it's not... Not um, on the PBS. It's not on so, the PBS yet. Um, this is going to sound like a strange comment, but what I think as an MS community, we need to actually get rid of the medical marijuana uh, using that frame. Framework. Sativex is actually a cannabinoid derived drug that was approved by our TGA in 2012. So it's been sitting there on a government list forever. State based legislation right across the country has meant that we couldn't prescribe it. When we talk about medical marijuana, it is a very, very different thing to a symptom specific therapeutic option, which we hope will be available for prescription come January next year. So the role that Sativex will play, yes, it's definitely from a cannabinoid source. Um, it has a 
great role to play in the treatment of spasticity and spasticity-induced painful spasms. Um, it is not a first-line therapy. It will be when other things have failed and it is, can be an add-on therapy. So we do have a lot of our clients, a lot of you guys will live with painful spasticity and spasms. For that, it is fantastic. What I think our government actually needs to be commended on, and anyone that knows me knows that word doesn't come out of my mouth too often, is that we did not actually insist on doing more Sativex trials and making you guys wait. We've got an approved drug that's been through trials in multiple countries, it's already available in multiple countries and already approved by our federal government, they've simply made it legal to prescribe. So we think that was really, really, really good of them. So um, we would need to go to our neurologist? At the moment, the way they've worded it to us is that we will be a neurologist only prescription, um, whether that's initiation or ongoing. We will probably presume at least initially will be ongoing prescription. The PBS part of that equation, sorry, is um, still going to be an interesting thing because as we've had from some of our clients, Sativex will be more expensive than going into the valley on a Saturday night and buying yourself a bag. <laughs> now, obviously Sativex has those other derivatives which tend to make us a little bit foggy and hungry, so I've been told, no personal experience whatsoever. Um, but that is the difference between when we talk about medical marijuana for things like cancer pain or the epilepsy in children. That's the other thing that is obviously very important that's going ahead in a Queensland-based trial. So we have a cannabinoid-derived therapeutic option versus medical marijuana. Just a, a question, it's a what if sort of question for the NDIS, if I could. Um, <coughs> I've been teaching woodwork at a school for um, five and a half years and um, unfortunately because of the MS it was getting more and more difficult. Is there some way that the NDIS can help me get back into the school? <coughs> to um, be able to teach again? I'm just inquiring. Um, well, I, I don't know if, if you want to answer that or do you want me to answer that or... Uh, you can have a go. Yeah, sure. Um well, certainly, certainly the NDIS has helped with providing ancillary things to get people back to work or to maintain their work. But there is also, um, we in Victoria and New South Wales have a specialist MS employment service, which is through um, Job Futures. And so that, that, um, that particular um, funded program through social services or Commonwealth is actually being looked at how it actually sits alongside um, and integrates with the NDIS. So what the experiences that we've had and, and, and multiple times is that people, um, is that the the NDIS has been able to provide all of those things like you saw in Lisa's video to, to help her get um, her life in together again, to be able to make that progress in back to work and to sustain that work. Um, so there's probably two things that would, would help you, I suppose, is someone to maybe assist you to, to make that leap back in um, and, uh, and to have the relevant supports that assist you to maintain that work, you know, because as we talked about today, fatigue is a major, major issue and often that is the, the thing that, that mean, means that people can't sustain or find it very difficult to sustain that employment. It depends on what you need. Mm. It depends on what you need to be able to work. Like, I don't believe we have to wait for the NDIS to get employment now. So it depends on whether, is it the school that won't let you back in or is it you need extra rehabilitation or services that you it's, can't access now? It's one of those things where the school, I, I mean, I have a walker. Yep. And obviously around a manual arts room, it's, it's a bit difficult. Yeah. With a walking stick, it wasn't so much of a problem. But obviously with a walker now, it's a bit more of a problem. So, But the school sort of looked at it in a way that I was 
and I'm not trying to be cruel to them, but <laughs> sort of looked at it as a way that I was becoming a liability. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Maybe you should look at yeah. a different school. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think the, yeah. Or look, different equipment. Have you ever, you know, like there's all different ways we can work. Yeah. I mean, I can talk to you off lot. Yeah. Not in public. But um, there are always better employers and better schools. Do you live in Queensland? And there's like great DES, like Epic Employment. Uh, I work closely with them that can speak on your behalf or help you with this sort of stuff. Like there are ways that we can do this without the NDI. I mean, the NDIS will come, but it may be too far away. You don't want to wait by the sounds of it. It sounds like you're really eager to get back now. So let's have a chat if you'd like after this. Two, two more questions. Okay. Hi. Um, this is a question about uh, what we're, what may be available through NDIS. Um, I have a service dog, an assistance dog, yeah. um, and I've asked the question to a few people and I've never really got the answer. My assistance dog is a necessity for me to continue to be independent. Will that be covered under the NDIS scheme? Um, I, I am not totally sure, but I, I know the um, blind dogs are, and I believe that I've, I've been in situations where assistive um, dogs have, have been for people with acquired um, brain injury. I can't see any reason why not. However, it goes to that um, what is reasonable and necessary. I, I, like I have my dog, he's just actually been put into retirement and I'm just waiting for a new, a new one. Right. Um, and so I, I want to make sure that that is... Yeah, I guess it depends what you're asking the, um, the agency to fund for that dog or for you with that dog. Okay. You know, is it, is it that you're asking them to fund the food for the dog or... Um, I'm not really sure what you're okay. asking. And, and that is probably unlikely that they're going to fund the food for the dog. Because in, in life... No, I, I was yeah. talking more about training, training. ongoing training and, and expenses, not in the food, but in expenses for retraining and et cetera. Mm. And, and, you know, I have to keep a certain level of, vet co uh, of insurance coverage up yep. and able to enable me to continue mm. to have that dog and pass mm. all of the test schemes. So and I think that's part of the conversation that you would have with them because right. what it is is about, well, how does that, how does that dog facilitate your independence? Right. And this is what, you know, the scheme is all about, you know, the proactive, the social part of the scheme okay. is about proactive and prevention. Great, thank mm. you. And last question. My question for Julia about research. So there are drugs for relapsing remitting. There's no drugs for progressive. Uh, is there research? Why, why is it when, why, when you go from relapsing remitting into secondary progressive, what triggers that? Okay, I'm going to answer. And Sorry. you know, yeah. And then, how does that fit in with this business? Because then, presumably, after you've got secondary progressive, or after you've obviously gone from having relapsing remitting to definitely having secondary progressive, there wouldn't be any drugs, of it, you know. So. Sure. Okay, so I'm going to answer one question you asked mm -hmm. and another one you didn't ask. Um, so the difference between relapsing remitting and the progressive forms is basically that the relapsing remitting is about the myelin loss and then the functional recovery of the myelin and the repair that happens within the brain and spinal cord. Once you move into the progressive phase of the disease, it's more about damage to the nerve fibres and repairing the damage, which is a totally different process. So the kinds of treatments that you need um, to fix that are not necessarily going to be the immune-mediated ones that are blocking that kind of autoimmune inflammatory damage that you get early in the disease. So what's happening in the brain and spinal cord in people with progressive MS is really a bit different to what's happening to people who have early disease. Having said that, um, at Ectrum's the most recent European conference, um, one of the biggest MS conferences in the world, 
they um, released some clinical trial results of a new drug called ocrelizumab, and it's actually the first clinical trial um, that has shown a drug that is seeming to help with progression for people with progressive MS. Um, so that was a trial that ran over many years and it can be um, used for relapsing remitting as well. It has good results for relapsing remitting, but it seems like it might be the first one that's having good results for progressing progressive MS. So that research is ongoing, but we're really hopeful that that might be fa fast-tracked as part of that international alliance that I spoke about. And um, hopefully, maybe end of next year, we might be able to actually have it available for people with progressive MS. So that's and very And that exciting. would be for secondary progressive as well as for primary progressive? Um, I think so, so. I'm not sure what the indication is going to be at this stage, but at the moment they're, they're seeing good results for secondary progressive. Yep. Thank you. It's we very have interesting. Thank you, Judy. Thanks. One last question, actually. Um, my question is in relation to the NDIS. As we all know, a person with relapsing remitting, we can be stunningly healthy and we have an exacerbation and whammo, our life has changed for 18 months and it takes a lot of treatment and um, um, intervention to get us back on our feet again. Should a person with relapsing remitting MS who is essentially healthy when the scheme comes in, should they register for the scheme or should they wait until that horrible day when it all goes pear-shaped and then hope that, that they're going to be able to register quickly and access services quickly or what, what, what would you think will be the way to handle that? There's, there's probably two answers in, in, in some ways. You, you can't just register for the scheme. Mm -hmm. you, you need to be able to have, you either have a disability or a significant um, impairment that leads to disability or that, or that you, might, you might enter the scheme for one-off supports and things through early intervention. And so that may be, you may already be, have experience of having a relapse. And so you've got that history of having a relapse and you know what that very much feels like. I'm sure you've probably got a whole lot of hidden symptoms too that, that actually make it difficult for you to do things um, day to day or uh, you know, in, a, in, a, in a week or something like that. One of the things that we've been doing is a, is a fair bit of work with the agency planners around understanding just what you're talking about because that's been one of the concerns that, the, that many, many people with multiple sclerosis have had um, about, well, how responsive is the scheme going to be to me and how am I going to, when I have this bad day, even if I have got a plan, how are, we going, how are they going to manage it? So I think you know many people are actually entering the scheme um, with uh, through the early intervention gateway, I suppose, to use these words, um, and and so um, what's important is to share with that planner what your history of relapse looks like, or exacerbations of your symptoms, or how it feels like on one day versus another, um, because what they what we have been able to encourage them to do is make is to collect that little bit of history and to try and make sure that there are supports in there for that day. Um, but the scheme and the, the has been pretty re responsive for those people who have already got plans. The scheme has been quite responsive in terms of the supports uh, of putting additional supports in. But um, certainly, I think it, there is no harm in having the, going through the process of having the conversation, of doing the paperwork and going through that. You're, all that will happen is that you will be said that you don't have a significant enough um, disability or impairment. Does that... Yeah. My concern is... Oh, no, sorry. My concern is... Um, I live in a regional area, a lot of the people here do. When you actually require that service, and it, yes. and, and it happens quite suddenly, yes. um, current experience says you don't get any help for months. You're that, left on your own. That's so my concern is, will the NDIS be able to activate quickly for a person who, who has yep. a trauma, traumatic yeah. event? Yep. And you will, so if, if, 
if you already are a participant of the scheme, absolutely, because those supports will be in your plan, you will have control over that plan and you can implement more services on a particular day. And yeah? don't forget, and just quickly before we wrap up, I, think, I believe, and I'm constantly in the fight of this, that all disability is episodic because I have an operation like once a year on a good year and for those four to six to eight weeks, whatever it takes for me to get out of my chair, I oh don't know, yeah, it, depending on what the operation is, I need support then and that's always been my parents. However, with the NDIS, and this is what I will be going in for with my plan, there's no guarantee, so don't please don't take this as gospel, is talking about those four to six to eight weeks because that's my biggest problem is those four to six to eight weeks. So being really clear about that, and you're the expert because you have, and NDIS is very, very pro about this, that you're the expert in your disability or your disease. So go in there with all that knowledge, but don't feel like it's like it used to be. You know, back in the day when we had to go into Centrelink or DSQ, and we were told to make sure we went in and said that we were the most disabled person in the whole world, that we couldn't do anything to get funding. We had to do that, and if we didn't get funding on that day, that was it, you're out. And that's, that is not the NDIS. It's a casual, good, open conversation with the planner to begin with. Don't have fear around it, but make sure you talk about those really difficult periods. And also don't forget, you're gonna find your own carer. So your carer can be anybody as long as they're registered under the NDIA with an ABN number. So you won't have to wait for the government to send the carer out, because you'll have your Nadine, Shelley, Karen ready, because they're your friends or they're the ones that you want to be your carer. So you'll already have them listed with the ABN number ready to go. So just to minimise stress around that. Thank you everyone for those questions. Would you thank the panel for us? <laughs> and in particular, our special guests, Carney, Julia and Deb. Thank you all. Thanks.